Um, great, thank you, Gustav. And he pronounced my name correctly. That's awesome. So it's off to a good start. Uh, great. So I've been thinking about things a lot lately, reflecting on the past. And one of the things that came to mind was the very first time I did sequencing. So it was uh, quite a long time ago. Sanger sequencing, manual, one bass per lane, auto rad, your, your P32 and all that. And I'm bringing this up because two things. One was I screwed up, made a mistake in the experiment and didn't get the gel transfer step right. And two, because I didn't want my boss to know about that. And the Seattle team, don't listen to this. This is not something to listen to. Um, I came in in the middle of the night to do the actual sequencing of it. And this is the first time I'd ever done it before. And I'm sitting there doing the sequencing and thinking, man, this is so cool that somebody figured out how to do this. And I'd say the wonderment and the awe that I had at that moment, I think is something that I never forgot, never want to forget about. And um, something that I think that was born very early on in my mind, something that I wanted to be able to do is develop a new sequencing technology and have that impact. And it's an honor to be here presenting at this conference. It's been a long time coming, 18 years uh, since starting Stratos. So I want to thank everyone for coming and also to say that very much respect all the technologies that I've seen here and all the things that people are doing. It's amazing. And I very much uh, love hearing about all the ideas and things that people have come up with. So SBX technology. So like any sequencing technology, uh, you have to be thinking about accuracy, throughput, read length, cost efficiency. Those are givens. I don't care if it's 1999, 2029, you have to be thinking about those things. But for us, flexible operation was one of the things that when Bob and I started meeting at Starbucks for six hour sessions, um, it was right at the top of the list. We envisioned a technology that can sequence up and down the throughput spectrum on the same system. Four minutes, 40 minutes, four hour runs, we wanted to be able to do that. And in fact, I've talked to people, I'm thinking 40 second runs for some of, the, some of the runs that I've heard from people today. So that was top of mind, and we'll talk about it a bit through the presentation. This will be a faster version of the presentation we gave at the webinar, uh, but it is recorded so you can listen to it and get a little more detail. Uh, John Mannion uh, covered a lot of the data structure stuff there as well, so I recommend people go look at that. So we'll touch on accuracy. Uh, the results I'm showing here for duplex whole genome sequencing for HG001 reference sample. You get an idea of the duplex sequencing accuracy that we're getting, and we'll cover that a little bit. Uh, throughput, we did some uh, seven plex whole genome sequencing uh, reference sample. One hour run, we got over 30x coverage in that one hour run, and that's about five billion duplex reads in one hour. So you get an idea of the kind of throughput we're able to get here. We'll talk about the trade-offs between duplex and simplex sequencing in terms of read length and accuracy. There's trade-offs there to give a little bit of an understanding about that. Time to result. We're going to show a really cool result. Uh, Sean will cover that uh, for sample the VCF whole genome sequencing in less than seven hours, which is really, really cool and, and a fun, fun way to represent this, the flexibility of this technology. So something that we've wanted to do from, from day one. And then cost efficiency. We look at it as all elements of the technology you have to be thinking about, whether it's the chemistry, uh, the measurement, uh, including reuse of the sensor module, those kind of things, uh, the, the, the quality of the data you're seeing, everything, every element of efficiency you have to be considering uh, when you're thinking about this. So top of mind, we are very comfortable with where we're going and going to be able to go on the cost efficiency. And one thing, you know, be nice to Gustav. You know, I know everyone's asking these questions about <laughs> about price and everything. And just to know that we've had him wired up the last week. I think Josh had the idea to wire him up in case if he gets in his mind to even talk about pricing, you know, that he's going to get a little bit of a jolt. So <laughs> you, you don't want to see that. I saw it during the test runs. It's not a pretty thing. So anyway, be nice to Gustav. Uh, OK, let's get into it. So OK, what is this? This is the coming together Strauss genomics uh, chemistry and the Genie Array technology. I like to think of two technologies that needed each other to bring out the best performance. Uh, we showed the systems yesterday, introduced those. Um, you can go see them in, in the suite. But basically, a separate synthesis system and separate uh, sequencing system. As you can imagine, those coming together at some point in time as a single unit is definitely something on our mind. OK, so what's our approach? So our strategy for efficiently sequencing DNA was to not sequence DNA. It was that simple. Instead, uh, convert DNA using an enzymatic uh, chemistry process into an expanded surrogate molecule to address the signal-to-noise uh, challenges of single molecule measurement. This was our approach. 
involved uh, really on the edge molecular protein engineering uh, techniques to do this. No one had ever done anything like this before. And so that was our approach. But when you get on the other side of it, you'll see the problems that you solve uh, on the measurement side, what you can do when you have a chemistry, when you're measuring a molecule like this. Okay, the building block for doing this is something called an expandable nucleotide uh, triphosphate, or XNTP. Um, our thinking at the beginning was attach a tether onto this uh, nucleotide at two positions. And we tried many positions, but alpha phosphate and heterocycle made a lot of sense in terms of the biochemistry that we wanted to do. And then have those separated by a cleavable bond. And we use a bridging nitrogen amidate linkage there to essentially, once you've incorporated this XNTP, uh, in a copying step, replication step, that you can then expand the structure, and now you have a code that represents the base identity. As time went on, we added translocation control because we knew we were really wanting to go in a nanopore direction, and this allows for clean, reproducible, synchronized modulation of the movement of this expandomer through a nanopore. And we also learned that most polymerases don't like XNTPs, so we built in enhancers to actually improve the incorporation of, of the uh, XNTPs. And the last thing is nomenclature, SSRTs are symmetrically synthesized reporter tethers, that's what we refer to of the structure. The other big piece to this is the polymerase. Uh, for, for us, it was pretty clear. We needed something that had an open architecture. You see where those arrows are. You need somewhere for these massive tethers to go. So we engineered a polymerase uh, that had that open architecture. It's a lesion bypass DPO4 polymerase, not conventional, not what you would normally think but we needed to have something that had somewhere for those tethers to go. And I can spend all day talking about these last two slides. My team could, and they're here, and ask them a lot of questions. Uh, uh, they'll answer the ones that they can. Uh, but um, just overall, we had an iterative process of surveilling, uh, re uh, refining, combining, and iterating thousands and thousands of polymerases uh, directed towards being able to better incorporate XNTPs. And ultimately, we ended up with something that has about 10% uh, amino acid change, 99.3% raw read accuracy for a simplex. Now, obviously, the duplex is much, much higher accuracy than that, but that's our kind of raw read total accuracy. That includes the polymerase copying step and measurement. That's all uh, rolled up accuracy. We turned it into a processive polymerase, which it wasn't initially, and strand displacing. So a lot of big engineering that we were able to do there. The workflow, I showed the synthesis instrument. Uh, below, or in the, in the suite, we've shown that. It's basically just liquid handling, guiding reagents to this fixed solid phase chip. It runs through a pretty intuitive process of you having an uh, oligo attached to a uh, surface. Uh, you hybridize a template to it, add that cocktail of reagents uh, to make the expandomer, cleave to expand, and then using an orthogonal cleavage, photocleave to release. That's the process, it's pretty uh, intuitive. And uh, it's what we currently do and what we'll do uh, for any uh, sequencing right now. So a little bit about that translocation control. This is a big deal because, again, this comes down to measurement efficiency. Everything is about efficiency. And so I show there with the green arrow that little uh, triangle holding the expandomer in place. This allows us to get good statistical sampling of the measurement. And you can see the level, uh, G level there. You then do a quick voltage pulse, advance the expandomer to the next step, and you see what that level looks like, and so on and so forth. So you get an idea. This is a way of modulating throughput. So if you pulse faster, you can increase throughput. And there's a lot of buttons that you can keep pushing on this technology to keep pushing throughput up. So that's one of them. So that box there that I'm showing was a drawing that Bob and I drew in 2012. This is what we hoped to be able to do. We couldn't do it then, but that was what we were drawing up. This is an image from 2019, so it took us a while. But this is what we were able to actually do. And you get an idea that we hit it on that signal resolution uh, of, of measurement. That's a single molecule trace that we show there. You get an idea of what homopolymers look like, that we have this deterministic movement of an expandomer through a pore. So you can actually use that to call uh, homopolymers. And we'll show data later on uh, how that looks uh, quite good, uh, actually. Um, and then that's the resolution, the signal resolution we get between the bases when you look at the level histogram. So we hit what we wanted. Okay, now you're on one pore. That was the data on a single pore on an axle patch. Now you take it to 8 million. Okay, this is where the Genia technology comes in. You see the 8 million chip on a PCB there, and it's essentially combining microwells, electrodes, detection circuits, and the ADD uh, conversion. And you get a picture on the right showing a bilayer 
uh, holding the pore in and showing an expandomer translocating. So the sequencer instrument, also liquid handling to deliver reagents uh, to the sensor module, which houses the chip. And it basically runs through a very, this is a simplified version of the sequencing process, but you initialize a run, you set up the run by forming the bilayer and inserting the pore. We do this for every single run. Uh, and this is a, an iterative process, as I've said. Then you go in and sequence for however long you want to sequence, whether it's four minutes or 40 minutes, clean the system, and then you can reuse. Okay, that's the process. Very clean. Um, when we've looked at this many, many times, no crossover samples, and it's a very efficient uh, process. And I, I, a lot of people have tried to do the Jedi mind trick on, on uh, <laughs> how many reuses. This is something that we'll talk about more over the coming months, but something that still is, is in, in process here. But we're very, uh, we feel very comfortable saying significant reuse on that. Another picture to show is the pore count. So at time zero, we typically get around seven to seven and a half million uh, pores at time zero.